Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I think we're gonna start, I'm down with the moderator. And I think what we'll do is we'll start out, we kind of skipped Andy and Rachel in the introductions, and then if Riley wants to add something. Um, so I will let um, our three panel members, starting with Rachel, introduce themselves and give a little bit of background. You're on, Rachel. <laughs> Oh, unmute. Oh, hang on. Okay. Somebody mute you? Okay, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> there we go. It takes a lot to set me up, Birgit. You're good. <laughs> uh, well, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Rachel Ranjitan, and I am the National Program Director for Impact and Sustainability at Network for Good which is a huge, <laughs> long description to say, I help nonprofits become better fundraisers. And so mostly work in partnership with foundations around the country. So we have a capacity building program that is a year long where we match individual nonprofits with coaches and technology so that they can raise money and build an individual donor base. And Cheryl Sukup is one of our coaches too. So <laughs> I'm among friends. Uh, I'm a, computer engineer by profession. I uh, worked in manufacturing for 10 years before switching over to nonprofits, which was always my first love. And so I'm really happy in this space. Uh, when I first moved, I thought, oh, great. I never have to worry about IT again. <laughs> and the very first project they assigned me was to install a donor database. So <laughs> uh, anyway, that's my story. And uh, I'm looking forward to spending time with all of you. Cool, cool. Uh Riley, do you want to add anything to your introduction? Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, just to reiterate what I said earlier, I'm Riley Randolph. I work at Sukup Strategic Solutions. We're a consulting firm located in Naples. We work specifically with nonprofits. Um, we do everything from strategic planning to marketing, PR, you name it, we can do it. Um, and so recently I've been working um, specifically with grant writing. And so I've been, you know, integrating data points and that kind of stuff into grant writing. And that's kind of what I'll be speaking about today. Cool. Cool. And last but not least, Andy, Andy Reid. <laughs> hey everyone, I'm Andy Reid, uh, not the Super Bowl winning coach, Andy Reid, unfortunately, I guess, but uh, yeah, happy to be here, happy to be invited. Um, I've got about a 20 year tenure in nonprofit management, uh, starting at the University of Florida and then on to Emory University where I work for the business school in the Department of Neurology and Health Sciences Center. Um, transitioning here into Naples, I spent a little, well, right at 10 years, I was the director of development for the Humane Society of Naples and built the building there on the Naples Airport campus. Uh, spent some time at the Naples Winter Wine Festival and also did consulting with a good friend of mine that I used to work with at Emory University for several years here and worked with a variety of nonprofits. So happy to be here. I am now working with PBS contractors. So I made the jump to for profit, uh, but doing some of the same methodologies that I was doing before, managing a database there, uh, of course, doing uh, CRM and, and customer relations as it relates to sales. So happy to be here. I'm happy to have you. Okay, I'm going to start out by putting the questions into the chat area so you can see what they are. And the first question, we'll start with Andy on this one, um, is a three-parter. Basically, what is good data and how do you know your data is valid? I mean, that's baseline. Um, how best to segment your data for various prospect pools, um, annual, major, planned, gift press, prospect, and how do you integrate prospect management best practices with your database? So. Yes, yeah, sure. I, I mean, granted, I'm going to skim over a little bit about the first part just because this is a very tech savvy group, it seems. But with regards to good data, I mean, it goes without saying general demographics, of course, having accurate name, address, email, phone, that information. Uh, in our market, seasonal addresses are important. That can actually have a big impact on your direct mail program. So it's important to stay on top of that and making sure that you've got their actual mailable address, even if it's not their local address or their seasonal address. So keeping on top of that. Uh, managing their current giving history, annualized at least I always recommend. 
Um, levels of involvement, uh, tracking them whether or not they're a volunteer or an event attendee. I also like to keep track of whether or not they're a former volunteer. That's something that can be a very good conversation piece and um, you never know why someone quits volunteering. So it's always uh, interesting to keep track of that information as well. Um, another thing that not every database has a field for, but if you can create it, it's great. Um, try to capture one unique detail, something about where they're from, maybe a pet's name, maybe their college affiliation. Um, that gives you a conversation home base, if you will, something that you can remember about them. You can send them relevant news stories that may pop up from time to time. Uh, it gives you a reason to touch base with these people. So as you know, fundraising is all about getting in front of people, and that gives you extra reasons to be able to touch base with you know something about them, where they're from, and can share some stories with them there. Um, also, whether or not they have any soft credit affiliation. If you don't know what soft credit is, that means they either have a family foundation or a donor advice fund that they give through. Uh, always interested and in, in great to be able to track that and in some cases essential with regards to the tax implications. And spheres of influence. Who their neighbors are? Are they on a board with someone? Uh, do they give in tandem with people? That's something people forget about a lot. Um, there are donors that give on certain projects and they do it with some of their peers and colleagues, especially if they're volunteers. So being able to track that is invaluable, invaluable when it comes to being able to reapproach them. And how do you know it's valid? Well, unfortunately, you've just got to get your hands dirty. A lot of regular audits doing prospect research. Uh, there are a million different prospect research tools and websites out there, but unfortunately, it's just something you have to really dedicate and schedule the time to doing such. Cool. Now, if you want me, to, you want me to move on to the second part, or you want to? Have the other panelists yeah, respond. Yeah, just go with all three questions. Okay. Then, yeah. Yeah. With, with regards to segmenting the data um, into the prospect pools, you know, first off, with regards to annual donors or annual prospects, I mean, all donors are annual giving prospects, period. That goes without saying. Um, it's up to you and your organizations, depending on how you're going to best solicit them, whether it be keeping them in the just general uh, online or email. Uh, solicitation database or, or efforts or the direct mail efforts or if you want to personally solicit them both uh, just above a certain giving threshold or in contingent with their their major gift solicitations but all donors should be solicited annually I think that that, that goes without saying and it's a good good excuse to educate them on why it's important when you're making those asks um, major prospects those obviously they have a uh, target threshold of giving or has a capacity to give at a higher level again that that particular threshold is going to be contingent upon your own organization what you consider a major gift um, those are important thresholds to determine because at a certain level you're going to want your board members to personally thank them do some stewardship activities that go above and beyond the norm um, other indicators that may uh, basically set someone up as a major gift prospect um, are they a foundation trustee or do they have a donor advice fund? Again, that goes hand in hand with why it's important to track that information. Do they do other charitable giving at that level? You can certainly find out whether or not they've established named opportunities at other organizations or at institutions they're affiliated with. That information is readily available now on the internet. Um, one thing that's a little more time intensive but well worth the effort is peer review. Um, getting board members or volunteers together uh, to, to really kind of look at your prospect pool. They know them well um, or can give you some insight as to what their resources may actually be uh, or what their inclination may be to give to your organization. So doing and conducting peer review is time consuming. It's a difficult ask, honestly, um, but it's well, well worth the effort, especially as you're gearing up for any type of major campaign. Um, you can also search SEC filings or declared sales of assets, whether that be stock um, or real estate. That's another good one. Um, those are readily available, and so you can kind of see when there are windfall events that may trigger some type of a tax liability that makes it a really, really good time to solicit those individuals for charitable giving. Um, and to dedicate the time to do the prospect research. Again, you really need to budget your time and make that a part of your routine. Um, how much is up to you, but the more research you do, the better prepared you'll be and the better plan you'll have for approaching them. With regards to plan giving prospects and how to determine who they are, some of the indicators include, you know, a sustained history of annual gifts. If you're tracking that over time, you're going to see a pattern develop. Um, you know, whether or not their particular home is, is held in trust, you can learn that information from a property appraiser site or some real estate sites. Um, that generally tends to lead you to believe that someone has done some estate planning to begin with or property planning. 
Um, or if they've established leg legacy gifts elsewhere, as I mentioned, you know, they have a scholarship in their name or a professorship in their name or a research fellowship in their name. You can find that information uh, doing just simple Google searches and, and that's easy to find. Uh, as far as approaching them, once you kind of find some evidence of that, you know, a great question to ask is, um, you know, just to tell them how thankful you are that they support your mission, but ask them if they have any charitable intent in their estate, whether it be for your organization or any other charities. You know, the reason you want to know is because we want to make sure to honor your intent, if so, and be able to coordinate that with any of your professional planners, any of the organizations that you're planning on, uh, you know, leaving information or assets for in your estate. So it's an easy question to ask, and it gets people to thinking, even if they don't have anything set up already, it's a non-invasive way to really, really get into that, that topic. Uh, and I'll, I'll mention a little bit later about, about planning, giving, and why it's a good time to approach that. Um, but as far as integrating prospect management best practices into your database or with your database, it's important to track your activity. Um, I don't know how many of you actually write up your call reports when you're talking to donors or prospects, but it's important to actually track that. Um, also to have a way or a field, if you will, even if it's, if it's secondary to your main database, as to tracking your moves management. Um, if you've got people, you want to make sure they're going through the four stages and that you're accurately identifying them and such. So that's prospect identification, prospect cultivation, prospect solicitation, prospect stewardship. If you've got a prospect that's not in one of those four cycles, then it's time to move them out of your, your attention span, so to speak. Uh, but generally speaking, anyone, especially as they ascend to the major gifts uh, status, they're going to be in one of those four cycles for the remainder of their affiliation with your organization. Stewardship is basically just an excuse to get back into cultivation. So don't ever forget that. So those are my highlights. I'd like to have my colleagues share their insights as well. Rachel, do you want to add? <laughs> There we go. Yes, you know, I think um, Andy's dead on. Uh, the things that I look for are recency, frequency, and affinity. And so, you know, when you're looking through your database, there are ways that you can score things, and you can use any scoring method you like. But, you know, if you have a point system based on how recent was their gift, how many years they've been giving, how many gifts in a year, even in terms of wealth and what you're able to um, discover about what kind of asset space they likely fall in, that can help you prioritize folks that you need to reach out to. And most important, I think, is uh, the donor love. You know, at the end of the day, we're in the donor happiness business. And so if you are in that stewardship cycle, more often than any of the other three, you're going to find that the gifts will come because you won't even have to ask for them because they will develop a respect for you and for your work. And they'll always be asking you, how can we help? At least that's been my experience. Oh, cool. Riley, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I just wanted to touch on as far as, you know, doing the legwork for the data in the beginning is extremely important. You know, you'll, if you don't do it now, you're going to get to a point where you're asked to generate a report by a donor or a funder or that type of thing. And then you're scurrying around trying to get all the data that you should have gotten six months ago. Um, so, you know, really just remember garbage in, garbage out. So, you know, what you put in is what you get out of it. So if you take the time to really cultivate your data and get all the points that you need, you'll be a lot more successful in the, in the end. Cool, cool. Um, we have a couple questions, and I think time allows. Magda, do you want to ask a question? Un Sorry, I had to wake my mouse up. Um, so... <laughs> I am pretty much in the role and I'd worked there previously as a temp and one of my suggestions was that we create a data dictionary so we knew what values were associated with our various fields so that we can hold the database accountable not and, and as well as the workers to make sure that everything's succinct. That got abandoned when I left and now we're scurrying to move to another database but that got held off so um, my question is really do you recommend a manual for your database and also how do you convince your staff to buy into it um i'm struggling with that right now and a lot of people are like oh this is easy and i'm like well no not really like we we need to really cultivate this and we really need to be thoughtful in a plan moving forward 
and then build flexibility into the system if there is new information coming in that we should track going forward. So I'm just kind of looking for advice on how, how to convince the staff on this and get more buy-in on it. Um, so thoughts, feedback would be great. I mean, are you referencing a manual just with regards to standardization of data entry or fields to actually capture or important information to capture? Just um, more on standardization on entry and why, and partially for the attributes that you program and how to use them and when to use them for reports, whether it be, you know, all of a sudden you need something for online donations that don't involve check processing how to also integrate that with your acknowledgements in mail and things like that. And I, I primarily work with Mother's Edge, but I've worked with Donor Perfect. I've worked with um, ACT. I've worked with IMIS, um, a couple other, I, I feel it. <laughs> so like for me, it's like, I always like building out the system and take it from like an IT perspective so that you have accountability for the work product that you're putting out so that you're not stuck in a situation where it's like, well, can you produce this report distinctly? Yeah, I, I mean, oh, act, boy, that's a, that's a nightmare there. You brought back some bad memories. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for yeah. the no, That's okay. I, I think, um, granted, it's too bad you can't have your, your staff go through a database conversion project because once they would have to go through that, they would learn the importance of, of mapping and, and, you know, basically recording things as accurately and as standardized as possible. So, I don't know if there's any way to even, you know, have them go through some exercises of standardizing data just to let them see from a standpoint of having to go through and do it, um, what the benefits of actually recording information accurately are in the first place. So I don't know, you know, it would create more work, but certainly something where you could would, would in, you know, encourage them to go through that process. That way they would just by, by generality and wanting to make it simpler, you know, start doing that more often and make it a habit. A couple of things that I can suggest to Magda, um, if you have a policy for data entry, especially around people's names. So nowadays you have many different kinds of family structures that didn't used to exist. Uh, and you know, you also have to decide, for example, when you, when one person gives you a donation, do you create another contact record for the spouse and make them a relationship? How are you going to issue tax credit? So when you show them the legal part of it, that you're legally required to issue the, the tax credit to the person who made the gift, even if they're a Mr. and Mrs., for example, you know, that's part of it. So yeah, part of the, them being able to enter data is them proving to you that they have mastered the skills in that data hygiene document. So you store them some records to enter that have complicated things and see what they can do with it. Uh, the other side of it is no matter how hard you try, people are going to do what they do. So having some kind of exception report that you can run as part of your regular um, data hygiene. I used to run for duplicates because uh, sometimes if people give gifts online and they, they enter their names incorrectly, you know, in, because of used two different email addresses or they entered all caps or all lowercase and it's a mess. So having a practice for regular data cleanup is good, especially in terms of duplicate email addresses or even just how they enter their, their names online. And then, um, you know, spot checking before you do an appeal or some kind of email, you know, take a look and see uh, just randomly through the list because at the end of the day, there's no way to check them one by one. But if you're doing those three things routinely, you should be able to stay on top of this a little more easily, even though it's not easy. Never is. <laughs> Never is, but and I'm one thing I've used to, Sorry, one thing I've used with a um, <laughs> kind of under, underhanded, I had a junior staff member that used to give me fits one day. So I purposely entered a record for a friend and had them send me an irate email <laughs> and showed it and said, this has cost us a donor for life kind of thing, you know, and that kind of gets their attention. So just depending on the personality you have, you know, resort to what you have to. <laughs> good, good point. I, I got I got to note that down, but um, I'm, <laughs> I'm, hitting, I'm hitting that roadblock right now with emails. 
um, and mm -hmm. I'm trying to get an in a uh, suggestion for an intern and someone's saying, well, that's mundane work. And I'm like, no, nobody above my pay grade wants to do it either, you know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, let's move on. Shamir has a couple of questions here. Do you, I think one of them will kind of tie in with the next question, if, if that's okay, the second one. Um, but go ahead, Shamir. Okay. Yeah, I, I was just wondering, um, you know, once you actually have that, uh, that cleaned up database uh, and you're ready to, to kind of make a marketing push, at what point would you, would the panelists suggest we start thinking about removing people from the database? You know, I've, I've just done some reading on, you know, some people have said that donors need to hear from you seven to eight times before they start paying attention to what you're asking of them. Um, you know, I just, it sounds like a, a lot, you know, it sounds like a lot of hounding. Um, in your experience, are there best practices around when you kind of say, well, this donor is not going to, you know, turn into a positive result? I can give you just some historical information on what I've done. Um, a lot of it is going to be dictated by your budget. I mean, if you're talking about from the direct mail standpoint of things, uh, generally speaking, what I was doing uh, with direct mail is after about, and again, it depends on budget, but between a three and a five year period, if there was no activity on the giving side, I would specifically remove them from direct mail. It obviously doesn't cost anything to keep them on the you know, email and other forms of online solicitation. But I was basically calling them after three years or, you know, moving them to like a telephone type situation. Uh, again, just something that's not going to cost you postage. Um, the only way I would exclude that is if they're active in some other way. There's going to be people who are attending events or maybe they're a volunteer. Those people I would retain just from an informational sake. So my ballpark was between three and five years, depending on what your budget allows. And to piggyback off of Andy, um, I think when you're building the relationship with the donor, you should ask them what type of channel or medium would you prefer that we contact you through? Because some people, you know, they prefer to have that phone call or they prefer to receive that in-person mail. And so you might just be trying to reach out to them via the wrong medium. So it might best work for you if you kind of have that conversation with them and try and see, you know, hey, do you, would you prefer that we call you or, you know, email is best or do you like having something tangible? Um, so that might to help you kind of weed out as far as, you know, if you're doing a direct mail or that kind of thing, it's going to A, save you money and B, it's going to save you time as well. I forgot to mention, the, the one exclusion is that uh, when people make memorial gifts or gifts for special occasions, I would hardly ever, ever add those donors to a, a database with regards to direct mail aspects to it. Um, but I certainly would if I had their contact information, their email or, or, or such, I would put them in those distributions lists if they checked that they were interested. Um, but yes, we, we marketed heavily a lot of the memorial gifts and those I typically never put into the queue for, for direct mail solicitations. I don't know if your organizations do that as well, but those, those definitely wouldn't be worth the effort of, of paying postage to continually solicit them. So a couple of things we, I, we used to do, uh, one is before we remove somebody from the list, I would send them a breakup card or email <laughs> or letter in the mail. Like, you know, we noticed you haven't, you know, engaged with us in three years. We understand if you've moved on and we want to be good stewards of the gifts entrusted to us. So if it's like the movie where you're just not that into us anymore, we love you anyway, but let us know, please. Uh, you'd be surprised how many people turn around and give you money at that point because they've been lurkers and enjoying the updates but just never got around to writing a check, you know? And then as far as the memorial um, uh, givers, Andy's right. I, I didn't put mine in a, a regular direct mail, but I did put them in an annual campaign every year, 11 months after the date they made their gift because it's a way to remind them that the anniversary is coming up. And I would always include an invitation that said, you know, if you'd like to continue honoring the legacy of the person that they've honored, you know, we welcome your support and here's what we did with what you gave us, you know? So I wouldn't spend money on them all through the year, but we do, I did have some good success with that. 
Okay, and Birgit, you have a question. <clears throat> Bring this back to technology. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it's probably a too broad of a um, uh, question um, and can probably spend another two hours on it. So what are the, actually the barriers for good data management um, in, in point of uh, technology processes and people? And people in that regard that I know that um, a lot of fundraisers are in major gift and in other um, um, positions are actually reluctant to put their contacts into databases um, just because if they move on to another organization, they take their donors with them. So um, have you, is that still an issue? Um, either locally or nationally, or, um, or and what are the other barriers um, for good data management, apart from laziness and buy it, but there are maybe others. With, with regards to sharing contacts, no, I, I, I've not seen that. Um, it, you know, granted this goes to the privacy issue, but if your organization has an established privacy policy, then you're you're precluded from taking that information from one organization to another so no i i, I know there are some um executive directors and boards and such that look at hiring fundraisers based on their black book if you will but the case the truth is is that donors you know they're, they're not fungible from one organization to another they, they have their passions for what they believe in and what they're willing to invest in but they don't necessarily follow people people do give to people but they're still giving towards what what their their passions are and what they care about deeply so you know personal contacts that's up to the, the fundraisers themselves whether or not they want to include them in those lists and, and bring them into the organization but i've never heard of a fundraiser that actually brings funders with them to another organization per se urban myth carry on <laughs> For, for the barriers that I've noticed, uh, one of the biggest barriers is turnover because the average development director stays 18 months. And if you're using a higher end tool like eTapestry or Razor's Edge or Salesforce, it costs a heck of a lot of money to train an administrator on that. So what lands up happening is the organization can't afford to hire somebody that's already certified with that. And now they have nobody on staff that knows how to use it. So they actually have no database. And so that's one of the things is organizations having tools that greatly exceed their internal capacity. Uh, and the second thing too is I think a lot of times executive directors take a hands-off approach to managing development staff because there is such a shortage of good development people. They don't hold them accountable for making sure that the, their data and notes are in the system. So, you know, as Andy said in the beginning, we should be tracking uh, productivity. So how many major gift donor visits did you do? Well, how would you know that unless you could extract it from the database? You know, so if you have policies and procedures in place that say that your major gift officers have to track donor visits in the database, you should be able to pull a report to see exactly how they're getting those numbers and the notes will be there then. But it's really a combination of policy and strategy, I think. Okay. Okay. Question number two. And we will go to Rachel to start this round. Um, how do you identify your VIPs and engage them during the crisis that we're going through right now? <laughs> <laughs> sure. So, you know, I don't know if any of you have ever noticed or heard, but the Pareto principle also applies to fundraising. So 20% of your donors give you 80% of the revenue that comes into your organization. And so you really have only one job is to completely love on those 20% and make sure that they absolutely love you. Because if you can do that and retain every one of those top 20% and upgrade your donors, those donors year over year, you're automatically going to raise more money every year. So the question is, how do you know who your VIPs are? And so ideally you would have a donor database that allows you to run a report where you can sort donors from highest to lowest in terms of the amount they've given uh, in a previous year. Uh, if you don't have one, just export all the gifts that came in and Excel as your friend. <laughs> sort highest to lowest and summarize. So I have a little spreadsheet that I used to use with my clients and literally 
I have a running total column. So if I took in $100,000 for the year from individual donors, how many donors did it take me to get to that $80,000 mark? Anybody who's at that giving level and above is a VIP. So let's say it took you 20 donors to get there and they, the, that donor gave you, the 20th donor gave you $500. You know, if donors 23 and 24 also give you 500, put them in the VIP too. So, you know, that's just how to calculate your de facto major gift threshold. Um, most organizations have an arbitrary number that says a major gift is X amount of dollars. But if you were to run this little spreadsheet cheat sheet, there's probably a huge variation between reality and what they think a major gift is. The other group that I add to my VIP is anybody that gives you a monthly gift. I don't care if they give you five bucks a month. Uh, those are the people that leave you millions in their will. So if somebody is committed to giving you $5 a month, then they need to be your VIP. And so the question is, how do you relate to these folks it's differently from how you relate to everybody else? So with your VIP, you need to be touching them every four to six weeks. And you need to ask, uh, sorry, I have three touches between asks. So when somebody gives you a, a gift, obviously we have the thank you right after, but then you need to touch them two more times, maybe once with a success story, another time with an invitation to volunteer or whatever it is before you ask them for money. I also like to surprise my VIP. So I look to see in my calendar, if I have a newsletter going out, I will note when that newsletter is going to drop. Uh, if I have an appeal letter going out, I note that. And then I fill in the gaps a few different ways. Um, I use multiple channels to reach out to them. So, you know, even though you have a mailing address, take the time to look up their phone number and just call them to say thanks. Uh, not too many people get upset if you call them to say thanks with no ask and just let them know you're thinking about them, you know. Uh, I'll also send them greeting cards in the mail. So what I do with mine is I use a greeting card company that um, you can create a campaign series and it goes out on the date that you want it to go out so you can fix it and forget it. So every year between Christmas and New Year when I'm on vacation, I will sit and design the following year's cards upload my list and send them. And it's always three cards. One is a birthday card, or if you don't have their birthday, the anniversary of their first gift. Uh, the second is around Valentine's Day. You know, that's always a good time to send cards because nobody else sends them at that time. And then first week of November, a Thanksgiving card because nobody else is sending Thanksgiving cards either. And so when you treat your VIPs to a combination of multiple touches on multiple channels, and make them feel like insiders, they're really going to form a very strong bond with you. So when crises come, you can rely on them. That said, how do you engage them during a crisis? <laughs> um, I'm all about phone calls right now. I tell, tell all my clients, uh, if you do nothing else, get on the phone and call every one of your VIPs. Make a joke, ask them who they're sheltering in place with, you know? Um, for me, I start out the conversation with, you know, who are you sheltering in place with? And I'll tell a story about my um, college-age daughter coming home and that we still actually like each other after eight weeks together, <laughs> you know? Uh, but tell a funny story and ask them who are they sheltering in place with? The reason that's important is you would be astonished how many people live alone and how many people over the age of 65 live alone. And if you know that people are living alone, that's enough to drive anybody crazy. And you can mobilize your volunteers to do wellness checks and be reaching out to those donors all through this crisis and it's continuing onward because loneliness is really awful. And as Maya Angelou said, people forget what you say, they forget what you do, but they never forget the way you make them feel. And so if you're looking at your VIPs and making sure that they're happy, everything else is gonna take care of itself. Cool. Cool. Yeah, yeah, another another avenue that I found that I've had a tremendous response to recently has been uh, video texts. You can do them in your own time, do whatever. But uh, yeah, just a quick little five, ten second video text has gotten me a ton of responses recently. What tool are you using for that, Andy? Just my iPhone, literally. Just just okay. a quick okay. quick little video and shooting it right off. Okay. Cool. Riley, do you want to add to that? 
Well, I think Rachel hit it, you know, spot on is that using a multitude of different channels to reach out to them, especially during this crisis is really important. Um, I too am a big, big advocate for the phone call. Um, you know, nothing, nothing's as same as getting on the phone with somebody and just asking them how their day is or, you know, exactly who you're sheltering in place with or that kind of thing, because you never know what kind of conversation that that can spark. And it can lead you down a road to them being, you know, a lifelong donor and then maybe even them inspiring others to become lifelong donors as well. Cool. Um, I, I have noticed yeah. Yeah. working. If I could add one thing to what Riley said, um, I had a client who has called 10,000 donors using an army of volunteers. She spent over an hour with one donor on the phone. She was a little old lady who said that that was the first human contact she had had in five days, sent her a $20,000 check. Now, not every phone call will lead to a $20,000 check, but there are two things that are important. First is that there are lots of people that are craving human contact. And second, donors have never been more accessible than they are now. They're stuck at home. They are looking for things to pique their interest. They're Netflix dolls and Amazon Prime dolls. And so you have really good chances of actually getting them to pick up that phone. Yeah. I, I have had donors that every time you send out an appeal, they mail you a check for $100, which is great because it adds up through the year if you send out three or four different ap appeals. But then when we were doing a big capital campaign, she wrote a check for $20,000, just like that. Oh yeah, okay, here. It's like, wow. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, Tish, you have a question that kind of relates. On Donor Perfect? Yeah, I wanted to know, um, you know, again, I'm with Sukup Strategic Solutions, and so we have a cadre of clients. and. Um, some are small and some are very, very large. And we have one client who is interesting in picking up the moves management add-on in the donor perfect system. And I just wanted to know, we have such a, a, an amazing cadre of folks here. I just wanted to know if anyone has used that. And if so, do you like it? I, I can say that I have not used that specific module within donor perfect, but I've had other proprietary software that I've used it for. Uh, are used it with at the university settings that I've been at. Um, I, granted, it's it's difficult for a small shop unless you are really taking the time to hold people accountable, as Rachel mentioned earlier, um, because otherwise you're just holding yourself accountable. And if that's the case, you don't necessarily need to spend the money to get a whole new module. You can actually just do those move management tracking, honestly, with just an Excel spreadsheet. A lot of times people do that as long as you've got a manageable portfolio of prospects, major gift prospects that you're working with. But if you really are working with a team of, of fundraisers or volunteers that you're looking to, to manage the moves management cycle with, then yes, it, it is worth it, absolutely. Because you'll want to review that information at the very least quarterly. Um, that way, A, people don't get forgotten about uh, you'd be amazed how many times donors can be forgotten if they're not being reviewed, if your portfolio is not being reviewed regularly. So Andy, um, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but could you for the, in, uh, for the innocent people kind of explain what the move, what a move management is? Sure. Yeah. I mean, granted, there, again, with, with time management, there's only so many donors that you can pay attention to, the universe that you're really looking at. So. Um, most people would say that number falls between 100 and 200. Let's just use that as an example. Um, so being able to identify or accurately watch how those people are being cycled through the development methodology. So for instance, someone would come into your portfolio, that's the identification stage. You're doing the research, you're trying to find out what is this person capable of? What would be the best strategy to, to, to move forward with them on an ask? They would then go into the cultivation stage, as Rachel mentioned as well, you know, three to four visits before making an ask. So buttering them up, for lack of a better term, if you will, getting to know them, uh, building rapport, doing the things that are required to having them comfortable to, to having those, you know, very intimate financial conversations with. And then the actual solicitation, and that's part of, are you doing it alone? Are you involving other volunteers or peer solicitors? Um, and figuring out exactly what the right ask is at the right time for the right amount. 
and that takes research. And then following that is, of course, the stewardship component, which is ultimately important. You can never thank somebody enough and making sure that they get recognized at the appropriate level that they want to. So whether that be a mention in a newsletter, whether that be a naming opportunity or some type of a, a visible um, stewardship component, or in many, many cases, just no steward, no, no recognition at all. They, they want their gift to be anonymous. But tracking people going through those stages is critically important because if they're not in those stages, again, you need to move them out and move somebody else in. Um, that way you can kind of make sure that you're spending the best use of your time with those that are the most important and getting rid of those who aren't and constantly bringing new blood in to being able to get them to that, that critical solicitation and stewardship stage. Cool. Let's, let's move on to the next question. And this is for Riley. Um, let me get it up there. Okay. What kind of data should I be tracking and how do I incorporate it in grant applications? Um, and then what should be in my logic map model? And you may have to explain what a logic model is. Um, what is the most effective type of outreach for the bulk of my donors? <clears throat> oh, unmute, unmute. You got me, okay. <laughs> so let's start that from the beginning. Okay. Um, so for the first part of the question, I'm actually going to take it as a two pronged question. So mm -hmm. with your donors, um, you're definitely obviously wanting to track, you know, the general demographics, contact phone number, that kind of stuff. Uh, but we also want to make sure that we're taking a look at the LIBUN and SIBUN. So LIBUN is last year, but not this year. SIBUN is some years, but not this year. Um, so, so you can kind of do a comparative as to okay, if they gave last year, but they didn't give this year, why? We should give them a call, see if something's changed. Or maybe, you know, they, their contact information has changed and that kind of thing. And so that report kind of gives you an idea of if something is changing with the donor, you can go ahead and give them a check-in and make sure that everything's okay and that you can keep them moving forward. Um, you also want to have their last gift date, their initial gift date, um, year to date total, and then their lifetime total as well. Um, and that'll, like um, the other panelists were talking about, that'll give you a better idea of who your 20% is and who you need to focus um, the bulk of your time on. And then in regard to um, the special data point that I love that Andy brought up earlier in today's meeting is that, you know, see who they're involved with. If they're involved with churches or community foundations or anything like that, can, that can kind of give you a better idea of you know, who else they might be donating to, or maybe there's another program that you offer that they're not um, informed about that might be, you know, directly up their alley. Or let's say, you know, you work with a certain organization and this donor, they donate to your organization and they also donate to, let's say, um, a humane society or humane shelter. And you're getting ready to have an event where the clients that you serve are partnering up um, like a bark in the park kind of event and that kind of thing. And so you can specifically target that donor to, Hey, you know, I know that you are, you love puppies or that kind of thing. You know, Hey, we're doing this awesome event with humane society and we would love to have you there. Um, and then that also gives you the opportunity to pitch them as far as, you know, would you like to purchase a table or buy tickets and that kind of thing as well. Now in regard to um, program data, this is kind of my bread and butter as far as grants are concerned. Um, and so we definitely want to make sure that we're including um, their age, race and, race and ethnicity, gender, program statistics as far as, you know, if your program is pass fail or graduation or, you know, how many clients you served in fiscal year 19, that kind of thing. Um, we also want to make sure that you're definitely incorporating volunteers and staff. Income level um, is actually really important as well. If you take a look at um, some of the grant applications, you know, they'll ask, okay, what's your demographic? And if you say, oh, okay, we serve this many people in this society or that kind of thing. But if you give them um, a specific, it really, really helps. So I'll give you an example. Um, you know, if we're serving 700 clients in fiscal year 2019, that's a great statistic that the grant reviewer is going to see. But let's say if you beef it up and it's more of, you know, during fiscal year 19, we served 700 at-risk teens whose families fall under the area median income of 50% or below, that gives the reviewer so much more information. And it, it shows that you know what you're tracking and the data that you're tracking as well. 
Um, let's go into logic models. So just um, a brief overview of what a logic model is. It's basically a graphic depiction of the services that you provide and how you get them to your client and how you serve your client best. And so it's composed of three different um, sections. You have your inputs, which are your, um, your resources that you're putting into the program. So let's say it's, you know, you have a bus that you're busing kids to and from school or it's materials or equipment or that kind of thing. And then we'll roll into activities, which is the second column. And that's all of your action components. So that's really where your timeline will take place. And so you can incorporate um, the training of your staff, marketing the program, and that kind of thing. And then we'll roll right into outcomes, which um, grants especially, and this is a huge, huge thing that I think a lot of organizations kind of overlook sometimes, is that outcomes is what gets you your grant monies. And so the funders really want to see, okay, yeah, you say you're going to do this and you say you're going to do that, but the outcomes, how do you measure your outcomes? And so you have to make sure that measuring your outcomes is really, really specific, like to a T to the point where there's no room for question. Um, once the reviewer reads your application, they know exactly what they're funding, how you're going to do it, and they know that how you're going to report it off to them. And then to touch on the third topic, as far as, um, outreach to donors. Like I touched on earlier, I think it's very important once you um, are building that relationship with the donor is that you have that conversation with them as far as, you know, how, how would we best contact you or what do you prefer? Uh, but then again, as Rachel touched on earlier, is that you really should use all mediums is that, you know, you might catch them off guard one day and, you know, maybe they say that they prefer email or they prefer, you know, newsletters and that kind of thing, but you give them a call and they're actually surprised and they're shocked and they have a great conversation with you and then that leads to something better. Cool. Um, Rachel, do you wanna add to that? Thank you. As far as grant applications, um, definitely Riley covered all the bases there. Uh, for the data that I like to track, um, definitely their birthdays, if it's individual donors, uh, just because that can really help you do things like donate your birthday campaigns and help you tap into their networks. And I also like to track uh, who their employer is because uh, lots of employers do matching gifts. So it's a way for us to expand the amount of impact we can create if we're able to point out to them that their employer matches gifts and help them along the process of submitting for those matching funds. Andy? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, grants are definitely not my forte, but uh, I've had some experience there. The, the one thing I would say is to make sure that you share your grant application activity and especially the successes that you have with all of your donors. I mean, people love to invest in, in hard work and uh, especially winners. So I would just say, yes, it's important to, you know, pay attention to the funding source. And of course, that's that's the primary area. But when you're doing these types of activities, make sure you share that, that the fact that you're doing it and especially those that you get, share it with the, with your entire donor base as well. Yeah. Um, and I think too that um, whatever grants you do receive, you should be recognizing the foundation um, on your website, um, maybe do a press release, um, just in any way you can get the word out that they are, that they give you a grant. Um, and I think. Yeah, the only, the only caveat I would give there is if it's a family foundation. Yeah. Or, or a donor advice fund, because they, that, they may want to retain some anonymity there, but a public foundation, then definitely, they absolutely would like it. And I think with a family foundation, they, they'll tell you, you know, we do not want to be recognized. <laughs> so you don't, you just send them a thank you note and and go from there. Um, so I think the advice I have too is on the grant, don't forget to say thanks to the ones that decline you. Yeah. Nobody ever says thank you for being declined. Mm -hmm. But when you can send a thank you note for being invited to submit a grant mm -hmm. and you can continue the conversation, those program officers are going to remember you simply because nobody else does it. And any opportunity that you have to share a quick impact story with them, we need to steward them just like we do our major gift donors. 
So if you have a client that wants to say thank you, and you can send a handwritten note from a client to a program officer, especially if they're in charge of a donor advice fund, and they can forward that to the donor advice fund holder, that's absolute gold for you. Cool. <clears throat> Questions? <laughs> I think we can unmute. And um, if you have questions, bring them, bring them forward. Sure. And welcome, Skim. I saw that you ca came in after we got started. Welcome. Yeah, I don't have a question. And um, so I just wanted to thank you to, to Andy, uh, Rachel, and Riley to kind of uh, really have so wealth of information that you share. So um um generously uh, on a tuesday night away from your family or for before or after dinner um we're really happy about that um we have a few more minutes so yes if you have questions um go ahead and and, and ask them yeah or just comments um we, we um, i guess mine mine would be um i have done that um you know the gave some year, but not this year report, gave last year, but not this year report. Um, another thing you might want to do is do reports that will show a bump up, you know, like a history of giving. For example, I've noticed members that year after year, like Donna was mentioning, they always give your $100 donation, and then all of a sudden it, you know, spikes up to 5000 you know, that's a huge impact. And then but did you notice that, you know, or who noticed that and just running reports and seeing that and seeing why, what, what made them, you know, engage so much more. So, yeah. So I have a question. <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, so we all talked about the amount of data that goes into a databases. Um, what are the three things that you think donors would really value to learn about your privacy policy? Um, and um, the background is that I have, um, um, I read the, a book called, um, oh, I forgot the name of it. It was, uh, it was about data oriented or data driven fundraising. And it came from a guy who works for a predictive analysis company. Um, and their outcome is that they, um, if a, a, a big organization kind of taps into their uh, predictive analysis, they would know that a donor of this caliber or this uh, segment in an average donates 125 so $125 a month or something like that. And if, but if you only ask for $50, you're kind of leaving money on the table. Um, so you should kind of ask for 125 And um, I was reading that and said, I get this, that the fundraisers would really love that kind of data coming through. Um, so they don't have to do the stewardship that um, Andy talked about and um, <clears throat> uh, Riley and Rachel talked about. But on the other hand, if I knew as a donor that there is mm, my whole life on display or um, yeah, the fundraisers develop a lot of online stalking skills, <laughs> um, I would like to kind of have a conversation about that, about the trust that I can have with that organization not to engage or kind of share my 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 information with somebody else um, be it a database or an or software as a service person or an email marketing kind of thing yeah. well, i'll speak briefly i mean every organization should have a written privacy policy uh, it should also be signed by all employees and all volunteers um, because they will have access to, to a myriad of information. So no matter, no matter what your organization is, you do need to have a written privacy policy, even if it's just a stock template of one that you can find anywhere online. But make sure that, that that's being – that way, number one, you can certainly tell your donor base that you have one in existence because they may not know. Uh, and that you regularly review it and that all employees as well as volunteers sign it. So letting them know that you've taken the steps to ensure their privacy to that regard will go a long way. 
Um, with regards to the stewardship component and being able to prevent people from finding out, uh, you know, w what people give online, I mean, there is a limit to what you can do. Um, certainly respect everyone's anonymity with, with major gifts. It's difficult to do because you have to disclose some of them on your 990s. So again, you really just have to customize what level of stewardship your major donors want and respect that. Um, but as far as the people who are, you know, annual donors, I used to try to just bump them into a category. So for instance, you would have tiers of, of donors. Um, even if you just don't put dollar amounts or put, you know, thresholds within a, a broad range, that way it's not easily discernible what somebody's giving. Um, and you can just, you know, title them by name and that way there's no specific dollar amounts given. It's just that they appear in bigger font if they give a higher amount. So different things like that, you can craftily hide what people give. But having a written policy in place and signed by every employee and volunteer is paramount. Thank you. Okay. That makes sense. A um, couple of the things that I recommend too, um, you know, the quickest way to alienate the donor is to add them to an email list that they didn't opt into or text them when they haven't given you permission. So in terms of privacy, I always make sure that our privacy policy talks about how we engage with donors. Um, and I'm very upfront with donors as well. You know, we don't sell lists, we don't share lists. Uh, there are quite a few um, new innovative things out there, like there's a data warehousing project uh, that I came across a couple of years ago in San Francisco, where small nonprofits will agree to share donor lists and donor data so that they can um, mine data that way. You know, I don't think there's enough upside to justify the downside and, and the breach of trust. So, you know, anything you can do to reassure a donor that you'll never sell their data or share it in any way, um, it goes a long way to helping them. I, I do want to make a comment about any moves management system. I, I, I recently worked with um, a razor's edge component within the last year, and I found the information dated compared to what I can do with, um, as Bridget put, online stalking. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it kind of amazed me how late the information was and not current. And in researching a prominent senator in New Jersey to see their giving capacity, I'm like, I know this isn't current, but it's also up to their disclosure with uh, a specific nonprofit. But um, to the point, like, I think you guys hit it on the head with looking up their housing information or, you know, um, how much they donated to a particular political campaign also because that's also a key indicator of their capacity to give because that money is not going to come back in any tax write-off so why not ask them for a ten thousand twenty thousand dollar gift if they're donating that same equivalent amount in a political campaign i think that's where the cultivation comes in too magda because it's really not a uh calculation that you make when people give at that level is because they have a relationship. So somebody might have given another nonprofit a hundred thousand, but yeah. that doesn't mean I can ask them for a hundred thousand, you know? And so in the, I always use a rule of thumb of inquiry, you know, discreet right. inquiry, you know, so um, handle it much like a sales call, you know, my first pitch is, you know, a discovery uh, visit to figure out what makes them tick, you know, what projects do they get excited about? What kind of philanthropic legacy are they trying to build for themselves or others? You know, what are the things that just excite them as a donor? And there have been times when I see donors that are not a good fit for us that I will refer to another organization uh, that, that does better align with them. And people think I'm nuts, but it has come back to me in spades every single time because that donor has never had somebody turn away their money and they always land up giving me money too. <laughs> so, you know, I think the, the research is important in terms of capacity, but it doesn't necessarily equal propensity, you know? And with the databases online, a lot of those wealth um, management tools, the scoring is insane. I mean, I looked myself up in them at one point and I'm like, where are they pulling this information from? Because what they said I could give was about 10 times more than what I would have been able to give, you know? So they don't take into account 
people's medical expenses? Are they supporting families back home? You know, for me, I have a child on a ventilator, so I burn 50 grand every year just on medical bills. So whatever you think I earn, 50 grand of it is going out the door, but they don't tell you that in the database, you know? Right. So I think when you build a relationship with a donor, it's a good validation. So it's always your gut and your heart that are going to inform everything. The data you find out there is just a starting point. And with regard to the move management, um, there are ways to mimic move, ma move management without paying for uh, modules. So for example, two simple um, hacks that I use. I created a custom field that says prospect status and I let them pick from one of four values, identification, cultivation, solicitation, or stewardship. So every time I, in my portfolio, they're going to fall into one of those buckets, and I can run a report and start it by buckets to see who's in which part of the cycle. I also created a common field, which is just a memo field, and after every conversation, I transcribe those notes from that conversation into that memo field, along with what is the next action I need to take. Um, most of the databases will have some kind of task manager there. So at the same time that I create my notes, I then create a task with the follow-up task for me to, assign, to do. And that's how I mimic moves management. So don't feel like you have to spend the money on that. It's perfectly um, doable with a few hacks. Thanks, and I can see that oh, I can see that a lot of donor management systems or CRMs actually have those capabilities because that's so intrinsic on all the customer relationship management that you have that process, uh, even if you do it in a custom field or any other thing. Yeah, so I agree with that. Um, anyway, I think we can Donna. Yeah, I think I think we can. Um, we're a little over time, which is excellent. I think have all this knowledge crammed into 45 minutes is um, pretty awesome. Um, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Riley. And thank you, Evie. Um, and thank My pleasure. You. Joining us next month, June 2nd, another virtual meeting, same place, same time. And our topic is nonprofit help desk. Um, and this is pretty much a round table discussion. Um, I hope Birgit knows that she's leading it. <laughs> I know now. <laughs> it's a 101. So if you know nonprofits that, I mean, so many nonprofits do not have access to an IT person. Um, <laughs> and this is kind of a 101. Bring your problems. Um, we'll probably, we'll get something out um, tomorrow. I will send out a follow-up email with a link to the video from tonight. Um, so you will have access to that um, and be sure to fill out our survey, um, which is very simple, very quick, takes, well, I, I'll tell you, it takes two seconds, but it really takes 10 seconds. Um, <laughs> but if you could fill that out, give us some feedback, we would love it. So thank you. All right. So the Thanks last everyone. action that we do is we do our group selfie and we all wave goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, oh, no, yeah. now I got it. All right, one, two, three. <laughs> Take care. Bye, all... everybody. Good Have night. a wonderful Bye. night. Bye. Stay safe. Mm -hmm. Good night, thanks. Yeah, it's good to see you, Ann. Good to see good you, to see Donna. You. And Janine, it's good to see your name up there. <laughs> Next time with camera. Yeah. Oh, Donna, thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Okay.